In this video, we are going to be talking about the pre-code film from 1933, Baby Face, which stars the great Barbara Stanwyck and George Brent, and it was directed by Alfred E. Green. And my guest today is Vanessa Butino, who was on my podcast uh, many times uh, last year and at the very, very beginning of January. So Vanessa, thanks so much for coming on again. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be back. No, it's great to have you back because I've always really enjoyed our discussions. And and it was you and Raquel Stetcher who also came on to talk about pre-code with me that really got me interested in this period of filmmaking in Hollywood, which I I really am uh, an amateur student at. But I was curious, when, when did you get into pre-code? Well, I've always loved films from the late 20s and early 30s. So I started watching them as a kid. However, I didn't know what pre-code was back then. Like, obviously, I knew these films existed because I was watching them almost every day. But I didn't know what their classification or what their genre was. I just thought, okay, this one's a comedy. This one's a drama. I didn't know what pre-code was until maybe I was in my 20s, I want to say. And then when I started reading more and more books about this certain period of Hollywood history, and I kept seeing that word pre-code repeated, that's when I clued in and I'm like, oh my God, pre-code means like this whole genre of films that I was already quite familiar with. I just didn't know that it had a classification. Did you, did you really notice, like before you knew about what pre-code was, did you notice that shift in like 1934 when this like movies just became so censored? Yes, yes. But again, I didn't clue in because I didn't yeah. know what pre-code was. So when I started watching these films from the early 30s, in my mind, I was saying, oh my God, these, these movies are really gritty. There's so much, there's so much naughtiness in them. And then when I would watch something from uh, 1935 on, you could definitely tell that the content yeah. of the movie had been censored. So I did notice a shift, definitely. And I think even if you're a casual movie fan or if you've never watched a classic movie before in your life, you can definitely see the difference between, sub between a film that was made from 1929 to summer 1934, and what was made after that. You, there's definitely an obvious shift. Oh yeah, yeah, no, certainly. And it's interesting for me as someone who always loved, uh, has always loved classic, classic mm -hmm. film, but really didn't, I mean, with the exception of maybe like certain films with Cagney and Bogart, never really went as maybe far back as the early, early 30s. It was always like the 50s, 60s, or, or even 40s, like film noir. And even, it's interesting to look at it thinking that everything was heavily censored or coded and then to see like these movies and they're just right in your face. I mean, they're not coded. Uh, I mean, they didn't show, there were, they wouldn't necessarily show nudity or like swearing and stuff like that, but the content was was up front. <laughs> you know? yeah, it was front and center. It wasn't hidden at all. And you know what? There were some nude scenes in films, especially in silent film. If you yeah. watch those like biblical epics that Cecil B. DeMille made in the 1920s, there's nude men and women in them. Like, and it's not even, you know, somewhere in the background. It's like right center stage. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's a definite difference. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. You're right. I know. It's quite astonishing. So looking at this film, ba Baby Face, what, why is this one of your what, one of your favorites? Well, Baby Face is, a lot of people label it as the quintessential pre-code film. So when someone is talking about pre-code cinema, guaranteed Baby Face will be mentioned within the top five films. Uh, this was a film that it, it does not shy away from 
illustrating the power that women had back then and still have now. So what basically this film is about, it's about a poor, sexually exploited woman who grew up in the slums, her father raised her, and he, he started pimping her out at the age of 14. And she basically she's had enough of that life. She goes away to New York and she uses men to get what she wants. So that's the whole crux of this film. Right. Right. And I, I mean, to me, that is, especially for the time this movie was, was made in 1933, that's revolutionary. Yeah. Because you rarely see films or even if you're reading a book from that period, you rarely hear of a woman using men. Usually it's the other way around, where mm -hmm. men use women to get ahead or to get what they want. So this is the first example that I ever saw when I watched this film of a woman coming out on top, literally. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's one of the reasons why this film is so revered and respected nowadays, especially by audiences of women. And yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's a fantastic movie. I think it was very forceful and I almost can't believe that it came out in 1933 or that it was allowed to come out in 1933. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's quite it's quite shocking. I mean, this could be made now. Yes. You know, I and I think even even now people would be shocked to think that the story is a is a woman using men sexually in order to advance. I mean, that alone is it's offensive to say that, but I think in this movie it's told with the utmost empathy. Would yes. you would you agree? Would you do you think it's uh, uh, offensive, or do you think because they empathize so well with her that you can't blame her? Really, I think it could go both ways. I think depending on the audience's personality, it, it can be taken as offensive for some. Right. But for others who are very open-minded and very liberal, I don't think it's offensive at all. Uh, so I know that when, th when this film came out in 1933, it was banned in many different US uh, cities and states. Because even though audience, audiences were used to seeing this content before the production code was being enforced, uh, even though audiences were used to seeing this, it, it was still very jarring because yeah. before that, you never heard of stories where women took advantage of men and used them. Mm -hmm. So back then, yes, it was definitely very offensive. And I think for some people today, it still can be offensive, especially if you you happen to be a very conservative person. Right. Right. What 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 do you, what is your personal feelings? I love it. I love yeah. it that it, you know what? I, and let's give credit where credit is due here. Barbara Stanwyck was only 25 years old when yeah. she made this film. I mean, that in itself, holy cow. Uh, and she was so natural in this role. She's incredible. Yeah, I think if they, if the studio had gotten anyone else to play this role, mm. it very easily could have come off as very over the top and very dramatic and, and overly exaggerated because this is a melodrama. However, oh, yeah. Barbara Stanwyck, she was just such a natural in front of the camera and never ever at any point in this film did I feel that she was overacting or overemphasizing any emotions that she may have been feeling during a scene. She, yeah. it, she was just perfection. Yeah, you know, I, I always am in awe of her performances because this is you know not only is she a natural she had such depth which at that time in and you see the other actors around her with the exception of actually a lot of the female care which we'll get to the females in this movie are all really really good but a lot of the uh other actors are very hammy very over the top but she is so real. I mean, when she gets into that fight with her father early on, when he calls her a tramp, yeah. and she says, well, it's your fault that I'm a tramp because, you know, you've basically been pimping me out since I was 14. 
you know, it is, you can really feel the emotion, how she gives it to him. She's so livid and you can feel how all that has been pent up until that moment when she refuses to sleep with that politician that her father is trying to set her up with. And I don't know where it came from with, with her. Cause like at this time, this is before, you know, Stanislavski training got to America where people were learning how to be much more real and, and to respond in such a way. Uh, some people just had these, these instincts and they learned on the job. I mean, there's many ways to learn how to act. And she was just someone who had that ability at that time. But yeah, every time I watch it, uh, it's, it's stunning. Even the way she was seducing the man, it's, 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 she's literally doing it. Like she's not faking it. She's tr literally trying to get, and as an actor myself, I know, like try to actually get that person to whatever, do what you need. And in her case, it was to seduce them to get ahead in the job. And she's was, she had, she was equipped to flirt and seduce in a way which was, was so effective. Cause I think the audience has to fall for her. Yeah. In, in a sense. So it's, it is stunning. Um, but I, I, for me, like I, I, I sort of, I, I don't find it offensive mainly because of the way it was dealt with, with so much empathy and the fact that she was uneducated. She was someone who was sexually assaulted her whole life. Her father was uh, pipping, basically use like using her as a prostitute. And she only has that one man early on who comes in and tells her what to do and gives her that philosopher, uh, yeah. the book of philosophy. Is it Nish? Nish, I believe. I forget yeah. the name. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, she, she th that's her one education. So her father dies. She's on her own. Um, I can understand that, you know, she, you know, if you teach someone to be violent, then they're going to be violent. So if you teach someone to use people in a way in which that you can get ahead, then they're going to use what they know they're good at, you know? So I think because it's done with the utmost empathy, uh, you know, and it's, you got, you want to show people complex and flawed and, and not just good and bad. I mean, she, she has all those kind of qualities. I mean, what do you think? I, I agree, and I, I'm glad you brought up uh, the scene with her mentor, the older man. Yeah. They never really mentioned it in the movie, but he came off as being, perhaps he was some kind of professor or teacher. Or Seems something. like it. Yeah, so anyway, he was an older man, and he, he seemed to mentor uh, Barbara Stanwyck's character, Lily Powers. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because a casual viewer of this film could come away from it thinking, okay, this film or whoever wrote it hates men. But that's right. not true. That's not no. true because her mentor was male. Yeah. And he's the one who taught her to become a master and not a slave to someone. Yeah. He's the one that told her, use men to get what you want. Use them to your advantage. So this guidance was not coming from another woman. It was coming from a man. Exactly. So, so it's not that this film is trying to paint all men as grotesque. No, not at all. Beings, you know? Yeah. Uh, it just goes to show you that there is kindness in the world, no matter how dire your circumstances are or how you've been raised or how you've been treated your whole life. There, there is a, a point of brightness. And for her, for Barbara Stanwyck's character, that brightness was her, her mentor because without him, she would have probably just stayed in her father's speakeasy mm -hmm. and continued selling her body for for money. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or because uh, I believe when her father died, she was looking for like similar work in like, yeah. you know, different, um, you know, bars and clubs, right? So. Uh, yeah, she would have went on, I imagine, to do similar things. And, and it's funny, you know, when you see the way in which she is with all the other men who come in the bar, she's hostile. You can understand why she's hostile. They're grabbing her. They're 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 wanting to go and go out with her and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, not that in a very forceful way to go out with her. Um, and as soon as he comes in, she's she's so kind to him because he's the only one. 
Yeah, you could tell she's so hard at the beginning. Yeah. Surrounded by these men who are literally just grabbing onto her. Yeah. And then when this man comes in, she, you could just see her whole body just soften. And I, yeah. I think that was a beautiful way of acting that scene for Barbara Stanwyck. Oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a really, it's a really touching scene. And even the guy's like, he's like this grumpy guy. Like he's, not, <laughs> he's not even like, like some like, like, in, like soft intellectual type, like stereotype. Like even he's like, what are you doing with yourself? You know, he's like this like angry grandfather, but he has good intentions. You know, <laughs> I thought that that was um, really, really well done. The other thing that I read is really jaw dropping in this film is the relationship uh, Barbara Stanwyck has with her friend Chico, yes. played by Teresa Harris. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned her because she never gets enough credit. Teresa Harris was a fantastic actress, beautiful. She was and great in this. I've only seen her in this that I can recall, but well, I, again, another performance that was so truthful yes. and real. Yeah, her and Barbara Stan with paired together made such an awesome team because both of them were so natural in their role. Totally. Oh, yeah. They, they totally. Go together like peanut butter and jam. They're awesome. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And what was, and I, I, when I watched, I've seen this a couple of years ago and I watched it again last night. And what was so jaw dropping for me, and I read that it was for audience as well, it was to see a white woman be friends with a black woman at that time. And not only that, to stand up for her, because on a few occasions, uh, they want to fire her, uh, even when she's very successful and she's having an affair with uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the heads of the banks. Uh, he says, you know, get rid of this woman. And she's like, no, she doesn't go, she's not going anywhere. Once the yeah. code kicked in, and I hate to say this, but any ethnic or or any ethnic character was relegated to playing either a servant, yeah, a slave, or or something demeaning. A maid, yeah. The film in this film, Teresa Harris is Barbara Stanwyck's friend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, 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 exactly. A, another example of using an ethnic character and pairing them together with a film star is if you've seen um, Shanghai Express with Marlene Dietrich and Anna Mae Wong. Anna I've May been Wong, meaning to. I, yes. Oh, that's a fantastic film. But yeah, Anna I got to see that Wong, still. She was not depicted as a slave or some kind of servant in that mm -hmm. film. She was almost an equal to Marlene Dietrich. And right. Dietrich in that film, uh, defended Anna Mae Wong and protected her. So, yeah, it, I mean, that's another example of a pre-code film where you have a white person and, and someone of um, eth ethnic background, a yeah. different background together as equals. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you wouldn't see that in Hollywood for until really Sidney Poitier later on. Uh, yes. You yeah. know, so, and that was you know, quite a few years after uh, pre-code. Um, the the only flaw of the film, in my point of view, is that it's 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 almost too short. I mean, I would have liked the relationship that she had, particularly with her husband later on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it, we, we could have felt that more if that had been explored more, or even like the roughness of her, of her early life uh, with her father. I mean, it, it really, it's such a beautiful story and it gets to the point so fast. It moves so forward so fast. I don't know if they maybe only could make the films that long back then. I don't, do you know anything about length or? Yes, so, and you know what? I have to disagree with you when you say you wish it had been longer. I think it's the perfect length. So a lot of movies that were produced in the early 1930s were very, very short. Not all of them. Yeah. I'd say the majority of them. Right. Some of them are even less than an hour long. And I think one of the reasons for that was because by the 1930s, the film industry in Hollywood had already taken off and they were making millions of, of dollars. And you have to understand, this is during the depression when people didn't even have money. Right. Yet, they didn't have jobs, but they were still spending the, the 10 cents or, or nickel or whatever it cost to go to the theater. They were still spending that every week. 
Yeah. And just be entertained for an hour or two. So this, the Hollywood studios were kicking out so much content and so many films every single week that they could not spend days and months filming one movie. They couldn't do it. Otherwise, ah. otherwise they wouldn't have enough movies to release during that one week for audiences. So yes, you had films that were definitely two hours or longer, but the majority of films made in the early 1930s were very fast, very zippy, and they yeah. were within maybe a week or two. Some took about a month to film, but that's the way it was. And yeah. the actors and actresses and even the directors working on these films, some of them were making three or four movies at a time. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So that that's one of the reasons why films had a shorter runtime back then is because there was so much else going on. The studios needed to release a certain number of films every week. So they, they had to hurry up. Yeah. Well, you know, I, what I admire about it is, is that the film says so much in yeah. such a short span of time and so much uh, happens. Uh, for me, I, 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 I perhaps, you know, like to, to uh, not that you don't feel it, but feel it even, even more so. I mean, the switch in terms of uh, when she's with her husband and then her husband's in trouble and she has the choice between giving up everything, all the money that she's now made in order to help him. Um, you know, she very, you know, it's, it's that classic structure where the character changes very easily. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, I think um, because we had seen so little of their relationship, it just didn't, it didn't hit. It was sort of like, okay, he fell in love with her. They got married. He's in trouble. Uh, she actually really, you know, loves him uh, when he's in trouble. And I mean, that's a beautiful message that she also, what she needed her whole life was love in order for he, her to be outwardly compassionate and empathetic and to be giving instead of to just be, you know, uh, hard. Um, I, I, I just I just felt it didn't, it, 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 I, I understand that they couldn't at that time, but um, I, I think it would have just hit me more uh, but did you feel it, it 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 hit you enough or what are your thoughts on that there's a reason for that ending so in and i could be completely wrong about this i remember reading somewhere either it was a book or an article or something that that wasn't the original ending the original ending was her taking her money and leaving oh wow so it was <laughs> so if that had been the ending it would have been perfect because that would have been, yeah, this girl was on a mission from the start. She she took men, she right. used to get what she wanted, and she made her own way in life. That would have been lovely, lovely to see. But then in the film, the version that was released, we have her taking her money and using it to bail out her yeah. husband. Yeah. Uh, so she spent everything she had to bail her husband out. And, you know, he had, I don't, I don't know if I want to say this because it's kind of a spoiler, but no, go ahead. <laughs> he had put his life in jeopardy, let's just say, and he ended up uh, coming out of it and living, living at the end. So yeah. to me, that's a very like tacked on Hollywood ending just to please audiences. Right. So yeah, there, there's, I am not crazy about the ending either because I don't think it does justice to everything that happened before it um but to please audiences that's what hollywood studios did they wanted to make sure the audiences left the theater feeling satisfied feeling right. happy with the film they had just seen otherwise they could risk them not coming back next week to see right. your next film right yeah that that would have that would have made more sense uh in terms of who she had been and all the other relationships that she had had with men when there was a, when the point came when she didn't need anything from them. She, you know, you saw with like John Wayne, I've got, I know a bit of trivia for anyone. John Wayne is in this a small part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. John Wayne before he was the John Wayne that we all know and Westerns and stuff like that. But uh, it was interesting to see that when she didn't need those men anymore, she just tossed them aside. She just, and and I think uh, that would have worked better. You're right in the sense that 
because we don't see a real love build with the husband uh, other than that she married him for the same reason she got with everybody else yes um that if she had walked away then yeah i think it would have been really perfect so mm -hmm. because they had ended it on this this optim much more optimistic note uh that's probably for me why it didn't quite hit because yeah. i didn't feel that she really loved this guy it did feel very kind of tacked on but i, I understand that like as you said the pressures at the time mm -hmm. yes in order to 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 have to make it you know so but then at the same time i i you know not that i want everything to be happy but i i i do uh i always i always love um you want it to feel real yeah yeah exactly uh i mean i i'm you know, I'm always all about, you know, I love Frank Capra. I love like the John Cassavetes. And they believed in love and optimism, even though they made it rough and more closer to life. But um, I think that's what they were doing here. It just, it, you're right. It was just so, it was so tacked on. Yes. Yeah. But, but, but uh, sorry, think, go ahead. I think to modern audiences, we pick up on that right away saying well what kind of an ending was that yeah exactly in the 30s that's what audiences were used to seeing so right. and that wouldn't have seemed tacked on or um you know rushed to them that would have been completely natural yeah that's true they they, they were much more accustomed to that yes. way of of telling a story this is only like you know a few years into having sound it, you well, know Yes, you're right. Mm -hmm. So, so they, this is just the way in which they were consuming stories. When the film was was released, the scene, the scene on the train, mm -hmm. where she, uh, the first guy she sleeps with as as he's trying to throw them off the train. Apparently, that wasn't they they wouldn't sh they deleted that at the time. They thought it was too risque. You, you knew yeah. that, I imagine. Yeah, so even the, even though this was a pre-code film and this came out before the production code was heavily enforced, there was still some stuff that oh, yeah. frowned upon. And, you know, the censors still had some kind of power and said, no, no, that scene is going too far. You can't show that. And uh, one of the other scenes that was deleted was the one we had talked about before with her mentor. Uh, saying to her, use men to get ahead. Oh, wow. Become a master. Not that's a such student. a crucial scene. Yeah, and that <laughs> scene was completely removed as oh, well. Oh, that's crazy. At the time, women were not used to hearing that. And yeah. the censors were probably going, oh my God, if we release this movie, we're going to have women going out onto the streets and just taking advantage of, of men. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have that. So that Oh, was God. Well. Yeah. Well, that it's like it's like a very noirish thing, like a femme fatale, which of course Barbara Stanwyck would later do, where you didn't know where their motives mm -hmm. necessarily came from. Uh, I mean, you knew that they had come from hard lives, uh, but in this case, it was that she came from a hard life, but she was actually used in that way, uh, mm -hmm. and that she was taught to do this. So it goes a little deeper than the typical, you yes. know, femme fatale uh, yes. that we saw you know, later on. Uh, so do you do you consider this um, the best or one of the best pre-code per of that in that period? I consider it one of the best examples of a pre-code. It's, it's not necessarily my favorite pre-code, but it's definitely a great example of a pre-code in terms of how far it went in its storytelling. Yes. Do yeah. You know what do you think about it? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it was on the Criterion channel a couple of years ago. And I was watching a lot, you know, because they had a Barbara Stanwyck month and they, um, I was watching and I had never heard of it. That's the great thing about that streaming service is that there's so many movies, even if you're a, uh, consider yourself, you know, a big film buff, there's so much that, that is still, you know, that it, that is still to discover. And I hadn't, heard of it and I loved it and then when you had rec suggested that you put on your list of one of the films that you really like that's pre-code I was like you know right away I just immediately felt that uh I wanted to talk about it as well I I you know I don't know um this period as well as you know probably you or or Raquel I mean I've seen 
uh, a number of them now, like the, the the divorcee I loved, and of course beforehand I had seen you know Public Enemy and and uh, you know the horror films that I know you like, you know Frankenstein, Dracula. Uh, but I'm still really very new at that this time between 1929 and 34. So there's still so many uh, that I that I want to see. So, but from what I've seen, it's certainly my favorite so far. People. People are shocked that these movies existed back then. They are. Oh yeah, no, I I'm That's still. Thing. Yeah, no, I I I'm still, you know, finding things that, you know, really are astounding to me. Um, was there any other final thoughts you had on this film that you wanted to mention? I think it's if anyone here who is watching or listening, I think if you're wanting to discover pre-code film for yourself i think this is a good place to start mm -hmm. uh, baby face or uh, you had mentioned the divorcee starring norma shearer who is canadian oh uh, and, i didn't and know another, that another good one i think to tie into those two films where it shows women taking charge is red-headed woman that starred gene harlow That's yes a great example so you know, if you're starting to get into pre-code and wanting to learn more about them, those three films are a terrific place to start. Yeah, very well said. I still have to watch uh, Red-Headed Woman. That was another one that Raquel had uh, highly yeah, suggested. Yeah. And like I had mentioned, this was on the Criterion channel at one point. But now uh, there's a great, I don't know if you ever use it, Vanessa, it's called archive.org. It's like a free streaming service that's uh, through some library system and they have a lot of old classic hollywood films and a lot of the pre-code films so i will leave the link in the description box for anyone who hasn't seen it because you can watch it on archive.org uh for free it's a really just a really really great film uh well vanessa thanks again for joining me i, I always really enjoy our film talk so i was glad you can come back yeah no i loved it i loved being back again so thank you for having me no, absolutely. My pleasure. Any, we'll have to have you back uh, again very, very soon. Uh, and for those of you uh, watching, there's also an audio version of my podcast now, uh, which you can find on Spotify and Amazon and the various uh, audio uh, platforms. And for those of you watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the Robert Bellissimo movies at the logo. You'll see it floating above my head right here, which is right to your top left. Just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release a new video or when I go live. Thanks so much, everyone, and I will see you very soon. Bye, everyone.